and really proud to have you today. Uh, in terms of time, uh, we're going to call our panelists, uh, Matthias, the moderator of the panel, please come up. And the first panel will be on the future of the New York City Medallion and SIS. When the panel is taking place, uh, we would like to thank our sponsor, NYG, VDMAS, uh, and the program also to make this event. <laughs> thank you, Camille, and thanks for holding this event. Um, I want to thank the, the school. Big round of applause for the council member. Yeah, wonderful speech with this music to our ears. Um, we haven't held this event in two years. The last time we did it at the SUNY Global Center. And um, we talked about a lot of these issues. Um, a lot has happened since then, as you can imagine. Um, in, in fact, you can argue that a lot has happened in the last couple of months. So we're going to try to tackle in uh, this half-day program as many of the issues, uh, which I believe, frankly, the chair has addressed many of them. And thank God we have somebody who's actually taking some steps to remedy some of these problems at the council over the next couple of months. Uh, the program is intended to be dynamic. Uh, we're going to start out talking about the medallion system uh, with this panel, and then we're going and we're going to address a lot of the. Uh, factual inaccuracies that are out there about the process, about uh, medallions and revenue and ridership. Depending on who you talk to, people still with all this data that we now have have a different, you know, different answer depending on who you talk to. Number two, we're going to talk about some technology issues. We're going to have a panel talking about some new technology and issues, which may help to, which may help passengers, but also the industry itself. And then we're going to go to a very important panel on equity accessibility. Um, environmental impact uh, of some of the policies that have been implemented or not implemented. And then we're going to um, cap it off with the suggestion that uh, Council Member Rodriguez had, which was to let's get the drivers involved. We're going to have a panel at the end, and I can't think of a university uh, academic uh, program that was held in recent memory that we had actual drivers here. <laughs> to talk about how they're impacted, um, good or bad. Uh, let's hear from them directly. And then last but not least, we have for closing remarks, uh, Nora Constance Marino, uh, one of the board members on the New York City Taxi Limousine Commission. What's nice is that she is an independent board member, so we'll, we'll hopefully get her views. So uh, two things before we start um, with the first panel. Number one, you might wonder why we're down here. Okay, um, unfortunately there's a miscommunication about the ramps. So our good friend uh, Edith Prentice reminded me that everyone needs to be on a level playing field right now. So we're down here on this on this floor. It's a little more cozy actually. Um, in solidarity with you, you know, it's amazing. You know, one of the issues that we're going to talk about today is if your mobility challenge. You know, the simple things in life when you have issues. Uh, if you're disabled and, and you and you're not able to. Um, get around the way like others, the little things in life become so much more difficult. Um, and we're going to be addressing some of those issues. Number two, um, try not to make me laugh or cry or yell too much because I have uh, some hurt my rib real bad in basketball. I won three of the four games. So I'm going to be very subdued today, but I'm in a little bit of pain. So um, I'm going to introduce the first panel. Um, we have first to my left, Taxi Dave. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, I think everybody kind of knows him. Uh, taxi Dave um, is a third generation uh, taxi person, okay? He was a driver, he was on the Today Show. He's been an editor, a publisher of periodicals for a gazillion years. He's been there from the beginning, um, and he's now the, in charge of the Taxi Cab Service Association, which is an organization of lenders. So he's worked for credit unions, he's worked in the industry, he's driven a cab. He knows the industry like the back of his hand. We have two very experienced credit union uh, executives with us. Tom O'Shea uh, from Aspire Credit Union, which, um, and he's the CEO. Tom actually um, has so much experience, not just in credit union uh, matters in the taxi industry, but it's a national credit union, members in all 50 states. And then you have Robert Fallon, the CEO of Progressive Credit Union. I'm not going to tell you how many years he's been there because he looks too damn young uh, to describe the number of years that he's been there. But he's been there for a long time. He was a treasurer. He worked his way up to CEO. He's been in the middle of this medallion crisis, so to speak. Um, so what we're going to do for our panels, uh, we're going to have some opening remarks. We'll start, I guess, with Dave and then Tom and then Robert will clean up. 
No, no PowerPoints. Um, we're going to keep it real today. No stats, no PowerPoints. We're going to talk through these issues and come up with hopefully some good ideas that policymakers can take back with us and also that we have academics in the room that academics can study. So we're going to start first with Dave. Each panelist will have five minutes to say what's on their mind about the medallion system and then we'll mix it up here and then we'll take some questions from the audience. A further ado, Dave Pollock. Thank you. I want to thank Matt. There we go. I want to thank Matt and uh, Councilman Ramos Rodriguez. Uh, you encapsulated all the unfairness and what's going on in the industry. You mentioned a number of things. Um, the 5% transfer tax, for those of you who don't know, even at the last medallion auction, the average price was over $800,000 or $900,000. The city made 5% on each one of those. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. On auctions, there is no 5%. When well, the value is transferred, there's a 5% transfer tax. Uh, in today's world, it's a stumbling block on business. Okay, so there was a 5% transfer tax for many years that the city would benefit from. And it's been a stumbling block for current investors. If a medallion were to sell for, at one time, a million dollars, 5% is what, uh, 50,000? And now that has been reduced to half a percent. So I want to thank uh, Donis Rodriguez and the Transportation Committee for doing that. There, there are a number of things that politicians in New York City have, have done. The universal license he mentioned brought hundreds of car service drivers who wanted to drive yellow into the industry and made it easier to drive a yellow cab. And, uh, but what affects the price of the New York City taxi medallion? Hailing. Some of you may have hailed a cab to get here today. Some of you may have seen people hailing. And there's the income potential from that medallion and the different ways medallions are handled. There are only drivers, and we'll get into the different differences in a minute. There's the roles of credit union financing, which has changed I drastically uh, in the last two years. Uh, congestion. I noticed there are people from DOT and MTA here. Um, you know, bike lanes aren't the utopia for transportation in New York City, but we'll get into that. Competition and enforcement, and then the workforce. Uh, somebody told me in the industry that without a workforce, every other problem is just a nuisance. And that's true. So maybe we start with, and, you know, maybe we start with the workforce. Why did drivers leave the yellow taxi industry? That was really the problem. You had only drivers and you had fleets. Uh, then leasing became prevalent the last uh, 20 years or so. So leasing medallion enabled people who owned medallions for 20 or 30 years to now instead of drive themselves, which the law required, to give it to a leasing agent. And now they could go into another business in New York City. They could retire down in Florida. And meanwhile, still have a monthly income of sorts from this leasing agent. When the driver workforce is depleted, who's going to drive those cars? Well, an individual can pay back his medallion and drive it himself. But you know, my heartfelt problems were medallion owners in their 70s and 80s who were ill health who could no longer lease, the leasing agents and every medallion owner are required to buy a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Okay, it's a great thing. Half of every, uh, half of the entire taxi fleet is going to be wheelchair accessible. And you've heard it said again and again. That's why some of the people later will, will speak to you about it. Yet, the app-based vehicles don't have to have one. There's no mandate. Drivers like to save money. They want a hybrid vehicle, like the Camry Hybrid you heard about. Yellow cabs are mandated. There's vehicle inequality in the taxi industry. Camry Hybrids are the driver's choice. Yellow cabs cannot be Camry Hybrids anymore. Is that because of a contract with Nissan? I don't know. Drivers want to save money. So you would figure the wheelchair accessible vehicles 
the new taxi of tomorrow. Taxi of tomorrow, it sounds so dynamic. Technology is here today. Part of this discussion is about technology. Is the taxi of tomorrow a hybrid? No. There is no purpose-built hybrid taxi of tomorrow or purpose-built wheelchair accessible vehicle. That's a hybrid. So if a driver wants a hybrid, hey, I'm going to go to an app-based company. I want to spend $10 a day in gasoline instead of 25 or 35 or 45 So that's how, and that, but that's one of the reasons that drivers migrated to other segments of the industry. And speaking of other segments, I want to thank the other segments of the industry, many of whom are here today, for uniting. Um, they've been hurt. The black car industry has been hurt. Every segment of the industry has been hurt, except the ad-based companies. We, we have a coalition of sorts. We're all hurting, so we're all working together in various things. But income potential, leasing, it was great until there were no drivers. Fleets, they get hurt also. There's a potential 14 shifts a day, uh, a week, I'm sorry, two shifts a day, 14 shifts a week. Where do the drivers come from? Where does the income come from? The price of the medallion, the value goes down when the income is reduced. Now, Matt has some statistics here, um, and the TLC has printed statistics. In the last year alone, drivers' income has gone down 15 to 16 percent. So if income goes down, if I'm lending money on a medallion, up until the last few years, this was an asset-based loan that lenders would base it on. Oh, you want a medallion? Sign here, we'll do the paperwork. And basically, in an hour, you got yourself a loan. There are different kinds of borrowers. There are borrowers who, as the price went up, borrowed money to go into other businesses, to buy property, to send their kids to college. Then you have people who never borrowed money, who wanted a nest egg for when they retired. They figured when they get old enough, they would sell it and then retire. Those dreams have been torn apart. There's virtually no market right now for a million dollars a value, certainly. Um, I printed out some stats from 2014. January prices over a million dollars for an individual, over 1.3 million for mini fleets. February the same, March the same, April the same. And then you look at January 2017, no transfers. February, a foreclosure and an estate sale. March, one transfer at $241,000. April, one foreclosure. That's what's happened. And that's why the transfer tax was important also. Some say it's too little, too late. But when things start picking up, there is one thing I want to impress upon everyone is there's a value to income. And even though the income has dropped, and substantially for drivers, there's a value to this in New York City. So I want to give hope that with that value, there's been no rate of fare increase, that the, I believe the medallion industry will come back. Um, I'll let my peers speak more about the uh, credit union roles in financing and the type of borrowers, but congestion, I, I just need a couple of more minutes because the DOT doesn't get off the hook with this. We have dedicated bike lanes. The chairwoman of the New York City Department of Transportation uh, has, to, has stated, I mean, there's 30% less space on some avenues. You have bus lanes dedicated on the right side, dedicated bike lanes on the left side. If anyone's trying to make a left turn where there's a dedicated bike lane, you can only fit like three or four cars. So if there's one more car that needs to make a left turn, you're blocking the two or three remaining lanes of traffic. It causes congestion. Congestion results not only in more air pollution, and I find it amazing that uh, the, the increase in air pollution with the number of FHV vehicles, but not only an increase in pollution, but fewer passengers being picked up. And one of the reasons there's less income is because of the congestion. Um, and mostly in the central business district. Now, recently, the chair, Adonis Rodriguez, councilman of the Transportation Committee, head of that committee, held a discussion 
a hearing at City Hall about congestion. I was there. I almost fell off my chair when the commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation actually made a comment that, in some cases, congestion is self-correcting. Huh? She also commented that there are fewer private cars coming into Manhattan. So where's all this congestion coming from? You have 100,000 FHBs in Manhattan. God bless you. This is good. You have 100,000 <laughs> FHBs now in Manhattan. And it's growing and growing. That number is growing and growing. 13,787 yellow medallions. That hasn't grown in a while. Many of them are in stores at the TLC. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Many of them are sitting on the street because drivers don't want to drive. Taxis of tomorrow that aren't hybrids. So, you know, I, I have a lot here, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pass it. I, I believe that we need, um, we have to stop the vehicle discrimination. That if we can't have a hybrid, a Camry hybrid, neither can they. Or vice versa. Why can't we have a Camry hybrid? Do we have to have a taxi of tomorrow? You know, it's a great idea to have wheelchair accessible vehicles, but we have to do it in a way. That's a level playing field. If we have to become 50%, hat based companies really should become 50%. It's the only right thing to do, in my opinion. Um, the city's help in some cases, the autonomous drive rule, the universal license, the 5% transfer tax. What else can they do? They can limit the number of hat -based, hat based vehicles in New York City. Thank you, and I'll take some questions later. Okay, Tom O'Shea from uh, the CEO of Aspire Credit Union. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tom O'Shea. I'm the CEO of Aspire Credit Union. We're located in Jersey. I've been you know, in, in the medallion lending industry since the early 2000s, so I've got some good experience with it, and I've seen it rise and seen it fall. Um, our portfolio, I'll talk mostly about the individual owner operator, since our portfolio is 99% with the individual. And we have seen revenues fall. We've seen that 10, 15% decline in, in revenues. But the, um, the vast majority of the uh, operators that we deal with um, are working harder to make, up, to make up that money. And it seems that the main issue they've run into is getting that second driver. That was the thing that put them over the hump. They incurred another twenty or $25,000 a year uh, by renting that car out for the second shift and the weekend so that they could have some semblance of life. Uh, at this point, they're working six days a week, seven days a week, 12 hours, 12 hours a day to put food on their table. So that's really the, the, the key to the issue that, that we've seen. Most of the, uh, our borrowers uh, just want to work and drive their car. You know, in a way, they want to be left alone, even though they know they can't ignore what's going on. They just want to work, work their business. And the smart ones really know where to go. They know when to be at the airport, when to be downtown, when to be uptown. Uh, they pay attention to uh, everything that's published in the in papers about events and, and, and uh, uh, masses of people around around the town. Um, some things that the city council has done, and, and Chairman uh, Councilman Rodriguez has been very much appreciated. I, I would echo everything that, that David said about the changes that have occurred. Uh, I still think there still needs to be a few more things. Uh, the universal license has been a, a real big help. Um, some things the TLC is, change, is doing have been helpful. Uh, the pilot on changing shifts so that it's uh, five to five. I mean, if you think about it, it's more of a, it's like a peak uh, travel time. You don't want to be doing that. Um, so there's, there's other things that can be done. But also the people in the industry, I think, need to help themselves a bit. Uh, I, I really have been an advocate to say that you need a, a universal taxi app. It needs to be one application that allows people to, to summon a, a cab. Uh, not two, not three, or not four. Um, with the market size of New York, if New York could come together and create that one app, you could create an app for the country that's based out of based out of New York. Because right now there are dozens of them, and you can't operate that way. People go to an Uber and they just they get anywhere in the country. And, and you know, my kids use Uber, and we're in the suburbs of Jersey. And when they go out on a Friday night. It's a great thing because there's no camps around where, where we're at. If they can get in the car and not drive and go out to a bar or a club or something. Uh, you, you can't beat the concept. And uh, whether it's Uber or or not with what's going on with that company, because they're, they're really a mess, the technology is here to stay. 
And I think the drivers and the owners in the industry need to adopt to that technology and take advantage of it. Uh, one other thing that needs to occur is, um, is to try to lower some of the costs. The hybrids are a great example of, of lowering costs because they're much less expensive to operate. Um, but looking at better way, uh, lower cost credit card processing, uh, meter uh, management, uh, vehicle maintenance, uh, insurances, there's a whole bunch of little issues that can, that can be dealt with uh, cooperatively following our credit union model. Uh, drivers can work together to create better, better pricing for themselves. So I think that type of thing needs to, to happen as well. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments on the, the TNC side, and I'll, I'll pass it over and then leave time for questions. But, uh, but I think there's some things that, on the TNC side that the, the city can, can deal with. Uh, one of the issues is, is vehicle inspections. They, these are full-time drivers clogging the streets, uh, yet they don't have the same vehicle inspection requirements that we do in, in yellow cars. Uh, you know, I think there's more rules around the UPS van that's dropping off my package than there is about around a car that's delivering a person. And that just doesn't make sense. You know, there's got to be a certain level of safety that goes with those vehicles and those drivers. And I also extend that to the, the, the vetting of the driver. Not an issue in New York City because the city has put a handle on, on how we bring in new drivers into those industries. But in other cities, most other cities, they, they do a self-inspection. I mean, that, that's kind of crazy that you don't have that regulator managing the onboarding of new uh, occupants, those uh, drivers to those vehicles. And I think those are a couple of things that affect the safety of the city, the safety of the, of the passenger. Uh, and just because it's an app, you can't hide behind that. It doesn't make it at all good because it's a slick, it's a slick app. There's got to be a real structure, a real foundation behind that to make make sure that the transportation network is, is safe and secure. Because you know, too many people get they get raped, they get uh, robbed. It just can't happen. You just can't do that. So I'll leave it at that. Um, pass it over to, to Robert, and then uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tom. Robert Fallon, CEO of Progressive Perspective. Here to speak last because I knew that every, everything would have been said before the got so I wouldn't have to say all that much. I would also like to thank Matt for inviting us and Councilman for his, his innovative approach. You know, he, he hits the nail on the head when he talks about a level playing field. If I wake up this morning and I want to be a driver in New York City because, like the Councilman, I'm an immigrant, I'm looking for uh, a way to improve my family's income, permanent or or temporary jobs for a while, why am I going to drive a yellow cab? Why am I going to drive a green car? Why am I going to drive a TNC? There has to be some rec recognition of a level playing field for this driver, or they'll all go to where they should go, where they're going to make the most money, where they're going to have the least hassle, where their life is going to be the best. Isn't that the American way? I don't think I don't have any quarrel with the driver making that decision today. My quarrel is with the failure of government to manage this properly and to force drivers out of yellow and into other areas where they're easily making more money or can make more money or are less oppressed by um, regulations or or police. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense. On the credit union side, we see a lot of this human tragedy that has gone on with the taxi medallion values going on. It was, it was alluded to that people borrowed against the medallion for a variety of reasons. Some of them paid bills at the end of the year. They would come back annually. Some of them didn't do that, but they'd come every few years. They were big ticket items. Maybe it was a college education. Maybe it was a, a home improvement. And as, as David mentioned, some of them didn't borrow a lot because they were depending on that medallion for their retirement, they were going to sell it. Well, all of those things are now off the table because the confidence in the medallion product has been diminished by the failure of the government to protect the franchise it created. When, when people previously would always complain to me, you know, go to a cocktail party, what business you're in? I'm in the taxi business. They always had a bad taxi ride program. Everybody always, people love to hate taxi cabs, in spite of the fact that in New York City, and we finance, progressive finance them all over the country, they had the best service, the best vetting of drivers, the best vetting of vehicles, an industry that really worked and served the public, but everybody always had a complaint, a complaint about a driver. So it doesn't get 
the public support that it might deserve in terms of why it needs to be protected and why it needs to be um, a blue ribbon committee to see what's gone wrong, how are we going to fix that, how are we going to move forward so that the owners in this franchise can, can once again have a valuable asset that they can use for borrowing money, that they can use for selling for retirement, and the industry will be a once again a fast track for people who come to this country with, with language uh, difficulties, with education difficulties, but the willingness to work hard. They get up in the morning, they get in that cab, they work for 10 or 12 hours, they support their families, and we need to encourage that. That's all I have to say. Before we go to the audience, a couple of questions for discussion. Um, does anybody have any strong feelings or opinions on whether a market will be reestablished in some type of vibrant way at some point on its own? Well, I or think do you think that regulation, regulatory changes will be there? Well, regulatory changes will certainly help. We're beginning to see the seedlings of the market now. Um, we're tech progressive as a broker, but we don't actively work as a broker. But we are hearing from brokers. People are beginning, they're bottom fishers, but that's what happens when a market gets to the bottom. You have bottom fishers, but people are beginning to call for drivers and saying, gee, maybe it's a better opportunity for me to be an owner. Now, what government can do is they can add confidence to that because now they're taking kind of a little bit of a pig and a poke. I'll buy it because it'll be much less expensive to own it than to rent it. But if they had the confidence that, in fact, the value will increase in the future, that would bring more people into the marketplace. Okay. Anybody want to answer that? Sure, I, I agree. That, um, and, and right now, there's a big disconnect between the economic value of the medallion and the transfer values. And typically, the transfers we've seen, there's always a story behind it. It's a retiree just looking to get out, which is really the tragedy of the state of the whole thing, the whole system. Um, there's the, uh, the estate sale, there's a transfer, there's a foreclosure. They're not true arm's length transactions. When we do our economic valuations, and we use a different number of different approaches to it, the values are in 500s. I think. Some a little high forward, but they're in 500s, so not a 200. And one of the ways I mentioned this earlier to someone, I said, you know, this is, it's, it's like if you were to buy an apartment building. If the building is vacant, it's got one value. But if that, the building is full, and occupied it, throwing off revenue, it's a completely different number. And the medallion, every time it comes back on the market, it's an empty building. And it's really, what does that owner want to make of it? And since they're all the same, they can all perform exactly the same. So when we see a high end on the revenues and low cost, every medallion has the potential to do that. And it's up to the, really that owner operator to, to, to make that work. So eventually we'll see it, and we are seeing some, some confidence. And, and we get the body pictures out, that tells you so we're at the bottom. But it's mirroring the housing market. They go it's going back into the uh, 07 or 08. I mean, it's tanked. Most of the drivers are still paying rent. Right? They're, they're paying, they're paying the bills. Yes. They want to work. Working. Well, most most the deals with them uh, where they pay less, less interest. Right. The vast majority of borrowers continue to pay. They come at their loans, as everyone or many people know, and if you don't, traditionally medallion loans were 25 or 30 year amortization with three to five year balloons. So since this crisis began, a lot of borrowers have come in, their balloon is naturally insured, and we're modifying them going forward. And, and for the most part, they come in, they modify their loan, they take the next three years, and they continue to pay. The faults are up, that's absolutely correct. There are failures, that's absolutely correct, but the vast majority of the owners just come in when their loan is is ready for modification and they want to move on to the next three or five years. I guess it depends on how you define the tragedy, right? I mean, I mean, David brings up some good points, but also, I mean, I guess you could say that the tragedy was that these two gentlemen who bought the medallion at 50 grand sold it for four times its value as opposed to a million dollars, you know. So still, you know, there was a, a return for those transactions, those cash sales. I mean, I think those two individuals, based upon what I heard, bought it at around 50 grand and, you know, I remember at the TLC in, in the late 90s and mid 2000s, we were touting a $200,000 price as the greatest price of all time. No one could see it going up from here. And then we have the chart that puts it straight up to the top. 
So um, I'm just wondering, I mean, because you hear all these things, and like, like there's guys I heard in the airport, they were unscrupulous bankruptcy attorneys, I understand, who I think we should talk about that and the process a little bit, because I heard that there are people, we see it with our own eyes, charging drivers $15,000 in legal fees to bring a bankruptcy to state of proceedings when they could have been using their money to work out a loan, as most of the lenders, even the ones controlled by banking regulators, are reasonable in, in coming up with new loan provisions. So for those in the audience who don't understand um, you know, some of these terms that the lawyers and the banks are, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, some of these processes and, um, and maybe to avoid some of these bad situations where these uh, bankruptcy attorneys only put you back where you started, and you just are wasting your money potentially. Before we get that, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, somebody buying a medallion for fifty thousand and only selling it for four. What do you tell the medallion owners who spent nine hundred thousand dollars? They went right into the city's general fund on the last auction. Nine hundred thousand dollars for a medallion, and what what did he buy? He bought the protection of New York City and exclusivity of the street hail. and all that's out the window. What do you tell them? Well, certainly they're not getting their money back. So that's the tragedy here. Not only the seniors who lost their lifelong investments, but newbies who came in. Immigrants who came in wanted to partner with New York City. They need protection. Uh, as far as the new loans go, uh, there's new criteria. I did state before, it used to be asset-based loans. You own a medallion, it was very easy to get a loan for a vehicle for additional money. Now, the loans have to be qualified, like any other financial institution. It's a different ballgame. Doesn't mean we're bad guys. Credit unions made a lot of money. Drivers took out a lot of money in refinancing. It worked. It worked for the medallion owner. It worked for the drivers. It worked for the lending institution. And now is not a time to panic. Now is a time to cooperate and work together. Um, I'll pass that on. But when we look at a, uh, a bankruptcy situation, I think that's really, from a credit union perspective, it's right up our alley. Because one of the philosophies of the, of the entire movement is, is helping our members to improve. So when we get somebody that's in trouble, they're the people we want to talk to. Because the, the issue is typically not just a value. It's other debt, it's lifestyle, it's a, it's a combination of things. So we can sit down. Uh, if we have the opportunity to sit down, we could work out an arrangement. Sometimes that's them dealing with other debt. I had an example of a, uh, one borrower who had a couple hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, and his payments were over $500 a month. This was just a couple weeks ago. And based on his income, he could file, file, qualify for an income, income contingent repayment of a student loan through the federal website and drop his payments to less than 100 bucks. So that's a $400 a month savings. So those are the types of things that we help guide people through. And then we see, all right, how can we work out the value of that? Do we take that large loan and split it into two pieces? Do we lower rates? Do we give temporary reprieves to reduce payments? Uh, to help them to help them through. And we do these things on a short-term basis because we want to follow the industry and see where it goes. So hopefully we can get back to some normal level uh, at some near, you know, point in the near, or near future. But we really, it, it is an absolute waste of money to, to, to go to the bankruptcy uh, group. Uh, you're better off taking sitting down and working with us to work through it. Because long-term, you're going you're gonna to maintain your credit, you're going to be able to restore your credit. The bankruptcy, and you're, you're basically at you're going to be able to borrow. From, from a practical point of view, just you know, using dollars, as, as many of you know, that at probably the height of the market, passive owners were getting in the neighborhood of $3,500 a month for a medallion. So what did we see in the lending institutions? We saw borrowers coming who would say, well, I'm getting $3,500 a month. Let me borrow and pay $2,500 a month. How much can I borrow? What's the interest rate? How does that work out? $2,500 to pay my loan, $1,000 for myself. I'm a senior, I might have a pension from something else or Social Security. Now I've got my lifestyle set up. That's my plan. Well, that 3500 went from 3000 to $2,500. There are, there are lease managers paying $1,250 now, $1,500. They're having difficulty finding drivers. 
So the borrower comes to us and says, well, I can't pay that 2500 a month. Is there a way we can restructure the loan? Is there a way we can help you? And, and as Tom said, there are a couple of tools that we have, uh, restructuring the loans, interest rates, a, a variety of different methodologies to help the borrower through the crisis. Paying $15,000, going bankrupt, ruining your credit, not the option to pursue. What's, what's the mentality worth right now? Hmm. <laughs> Whatever anyone's willing to pay for it. Yeah. 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 I mean, we know that the, the courts have. Uh, um, it's a scary time, man. Okay. Well, the courts have accepted valuations, and the banking regulators at much more than the two hundred range, right? I think the five four, four, five high four fours, fives. But it would be foolish to take the lowest value each time there's a transfer. Say, oh, that's the new value, race to the bottom. When there are borrowers regularly coming in and renewing loans at five hundred thousand dollars. And all of you have mentioned at one point that it's an income-producing asset. The revenue is there. So, you know, the stacks are one thing. The stats, the 15% drop or, you know, in ridership, the stats are across the board for all the drivers. All drivers are not the same, right? Some work more than others, some know where to go. I think you, you mentioned that. Um, have we also seen, uh, in terms of the owners, the fleet owners' revenue, has there been a decline in the amount that, that those who are leasing uh, have felt as well? Or what's going on on the cash flow income side of this. I think you all kind of, at some point, alluded to the fact that it's not necessarily that someone's willing to pay as much as it is now as an income producing asset, like a, a property that's being leased, right? Well, drivers are renters. There are less renters. So if, if, we're, if, if owners are landlords and drivers are renters and there are less renters, then the landlords are making less money. I mean, that just is a fact that they're, they're making less money and they can also uh, they're not able to charge as much money to rent as they previously did. The, the city has a lease cap. And I would say from 2005 to 2013, for the most part, drivers paid the lease cap rates on a daily basis or weekly basis or dove basis, whatever that, that was. And fleet operators and individual medallion owners had a re regular and ready supply of drivers. The owners were making money. The drivers were making money. Everyone, everyone was very uh, confident with the way the system was working. The collapse of the driver pool has caused all of that to go into disarray. And then you have an allowance in New York State, June 29th, the TNC law in New York State. That means everybody in this room and your grandmothers who drive can be an Uber bar. In New York City, you're supposed to be registered and have plates and commercial insurance, etc. Uh, I was up in Westchester. Westchester, you might have heard on 1010 Winds or 880 this morning. They're having problems with it. Why? Well, when you hear something like 43 drivers were turned down for act licenses in Westchester, and every one of them is driving an, an app-based vehicle now, there's something wrong with that vehicle. Why do you deny the act license? Is it a criminal problem? Is it a driver's license problem? An insurance problem? I, I don't know. But I do know this. Once again, you need a level playing field. And there are things people haven't thought of. They say that, oh, you drive your private car, and I'll just make this quick. Here's a synopsis. You drive your private car, your liability coverage covers you while you're driving. You get a new insurance policy, by the way. I think the first sentence says, this will not be used as a commercial vehicle for Uber or an app-based company. Um, but when you pick up an Uber fare, the Uber insurance kicks in. And I know from friends in the industry in different segments that it's nature. The driver might say, hey, can we do call me privately next time you want to go to the airport? You're a big tipper. Or the passenger might say, I love your car. I love talking to you. Can we do this? Hey, who wants to pay 25 or 30%? And that fare occurs, and then there's a horrific accident. A liability covered company denies coverage because it was used for a commercial purpose, and who with him denies coverage because he didn't log in. Who pays for that? The people who pay insurance in New York State, you will see your rates go up tremendously as a result of this, okay? There needs to be a level playing field. Take an example. 80 years this industry has lived in New York City. We have a taxi commission. We have regulations. It's worked until people try to work around 
the rules and regulations. You should follow us, not circumvent our rules and regulations. So I'm glad you brought that up here because that was a good next question. This is clearly going to is a cause for concern, right? People who are unqualified, if Nassau and Westchester don't opt out of this new TNC law, are going to be able to, I think, if they own a car now in the delivery industry, they'll get a massive premium reduction by just showing up and registering Westchester. But more likely, like David mentioned, you're probably going to get a lot of folks who couldn't hack it, so to speak, as a cab or a, ta a limousine uh, licensee in these jurisdictions, and Uber's going to expand the pie. And, and by the way, Uber and Lyft were, once again, invited several times, and they just refused to show up to these events, and that's very unfortunate. Um, because we'd love to hear from them. Look, there's no shortage of opinions here. You know, hear a lot of people disagreeing today. Um, but I think, you know, this is a cause for concern um, for, you know, as, as, as long as the chairman's with us today. Um, we had a couple of ideas, right? We, we talked, and I just want to get them all out of here before we go to the audience questions. Number one, we heard about uh, Tom's suggestion about a universal taxi app, which uh, they tried to do in Chicago, but they just picked two apps, so it's not really universal. It's like a parallel universe. They have two apps there. Montreal is looking to get one app. I think there's talk of that. You talked about the cap. That's obvious. Concerns about the TNC law getting rid of reciprocity and causing an influx of unqualified people at the borders coming into the city and taking business. You also mentioned um, pricing. Um, and we haven't spoken about a fare increase. So last question, I mean, what else have I missed? That that you think would be helpful to reestablishing the market in terms of a policy change. And there was a whole big, huge fair increase, brouhaha, the TLC a couple of months ago. Is a fair increase a good or a bad thing at this critical point in time for the market? I'm of the opinion a fair increase is a good thing. It's a good thing because we need to bring, bring drivers back. If they make more money, it's, it's, it's simple math. You make more money, they will come. Build it and they will come. Give them an increase, they will come. A lot of people disagree with me. Oh, you know, you're going to hurt the riding public. Well, just like there are bottom feeders, the line of dice, there are bottom feeders who want the cheapest transportation in New York City. That's very nice. We don't need the bottom feeders, okay? We need people who want good service, safe service, who've been vetted over by the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And another thing we need, what does MTA give us? And every time you get into a yellow cab, there's a 50 cent surcharge, right? That's a tax. That goes to the MTA. Drivers are tax collectors for the MTA. What does the yellow industry get from the MTA? On Madison Avenue in the bus lane, if you get in a cab on whatever it is, uh, 42nd Street, you can't make a right turn to go east until you're in the 60s if you have a passenger. What are, what are they getting for this? They give nothing. Okay? We need cooperation from those mega agencies like the MTA. Give us something to make life easier, okay? Because we're all in the same districts, moving people. And and then we have NYPD. Um, chief Chan, who's the chief of transportation, uh, spoke at City Hall about congestion. And you may think that there's not enough enforcement. There can always be more enforcement, but when you see a car blocking the box, gee, no one gives tickets. A car in a bus stop, no one gives tickets. Uh, real quick, 3.2 million parking summonses as of May. Uh, stopping the flow of traffic summonses, no stopping. 20,000 summonses, no standing. 352,000 summonses. Bus lane summonses, 7,300. Traffic lanes, 60 or up 60%. Double parking, 224,000. Locking the box, 2,000 summonses. And their mantra, is they claim reduce collisions, move traffic, protect the pedestrians, move traffic, save lives, move traffic, move traffic, move traffic, move traffic. Guess what? Traffic is moving. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't work. The DOT has had long enough to fix the problem. NYPD is trying. They take their marching orders. MTA, you're getting money. You've taken what you've helped to take away um, square footage on the avenues in New York City. Help us move people also. Well, now we got big problems because not all that money from the MTA tax, the service has gotten worse and the trains aren't running either. So I guess we should just tell the commute. Um, Tom and uh, <laughs> what, I, what kind of issue I have with it, with, um, let's say the Ubers, is the surge pricing. 
Yeah. Uh, and I equate that to if it's Home Depot quadrupled the price of sheet of plywood following Superstorm Sandy. Someone would go to jail. That was criminal. You know, they're not permitted to do that, yet when you put it behind an app and call it search pricing, it's all good. It doesn't make any sense. I, I have a real issue with that. You should be able to get it fair, fair is fair is fair. Get a big number and go with it without price counting. You know, the, the title of this um, session, which I, I, maybe we could finish on this, um, is politics. I think, look, I was at TLC for a long time. This is a very political industry. There's nothing, there's no aspect, there's no such thing as urban planners and transportation planners sitting around a desk with whiteboards. That doesn't happen, okay? Every single thing is political. Every single thing that happens or doesn't happen. It's unfortunate because the TLC, I think, was set up in a way where it wasn't supposed to be political as the board of the commission, in theory, as the MTA. But, you know, you know how, how much this politics uh, in the current state of New York in, in, interfere with or help us get things done? Because clearly, the cap, the failed cap scenario, things that have been done, the timing of them, it's all about politics. Is there a way to depoliticize this whole thing? Because everything is political, media driven, and to say that the media had nothing to do with the fall of the medallion prices is silly because they did. It was a front page New York Times article written by a columnist that caused the market to freeze. A single article by a columnist. Not even a reporter, a columnist. So so what do we have to say about politics? Is the politics in our favor or against us? Uh, if the mayor gets reelected, is he going to do a cap? Is the TLC going to revisit that flawed McKinsey study? What, what's going to happen? Politics and, and government go together. Uh, the politicians are the only ones who can put pressure on government to do their job properly. So if government hasn't done their job properly because politicians have failed to influence them to do so. Okay. Follow the money. Um, are you going to run for mayor, Dave? <laughs> the green cars. I can remember going to many politicians' offices, and we were told every FHD is going to become a green car. It'll alleviate the gypsy problem. Remember that? That term, gypsies? It'll alleviate the gypsy problem because every non yellow that picks up street hails above 96 degrees is going to be a green car. Now the green cars are almost going out of business. Because guess what? The people I speak with in the green car industry tell me what's their biggest complaint? They get cut off by app-based cars, they got a street house. Okay? It's notice that when you mentioned politics, uh, the chairman of the transportation committee left. <laughs> but I don't know, no correlation, I love it. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I'm not running from there. But I, I just have to say, politicians, if there's this misnomer out there that medallion owners were millionaires and that they had caviar and champagne for breakfast on their yachts. Okay, that was, that, that's the way, oh, you own a medallion? Oh my God, you own a medallion. Not realizing that what a purchaser really bought was he bought a job to work 12 hours a day, six days a week. Hopefully he had another driver, which you can't get now. And now you don't even have the support of the politicians. They've tried to do things, but it's not enough. So we need, you know, we, we need some big stuff done. We need vehicle equality you know, to start with. We need the MTA to help us. We need less congestion. I mean, there's an overall picture. and. Um, and financing, I, I really can't talk about, so I won't. Maybe I will fund for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for one or two questions. Yes. Yeah. If you come up to other, this one, you want to do that. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. um, Matthew, I, I fully concur with the unfairness that you described in the, in the different industries. And if you equaled all the unfairness that was in there, I think that would bring back a significant portion of, of the, the yellow has ability to compete. But I think people have gone to the app application because it offers a consumer service that they weren't able to get. Also for regulations getting in the way. 
And do you see a path through for the yellow cab industry to offer competitive service with what the rest of the industry has had, and perhaps even better service than the apps they've been able to provide, a different way of pricing structure, pickup, whatever it is you think you've been thinking about. There's another panel, and I think uh, one of the app-based companies is going to be on that panel or two. And that question is, they be more qualified to answer it. But I will tell you this. There are apps in yellow caps. Yellow caps have two major apps. Um, Curve, and what's the other one? Arrow. 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 There we go. The, the difference is this. If I'm a, one of the 60 million tourists who come in, and I don't know anything, whether I'm in Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit, Miami, or New York, I have Uber. I can't call the yellow cab for New York City and all those cities. The New York City apps are just the New York City. So that's, the, that's a little bit of a disadvantage from the business point of view and from people who travel around. Yes, uh, one more. We have the first. Uh, just actually one comment, I'll have tons of them based on all things that have been said. Um, Sergio, you meant we were talking earlier about uh, the Universal Act. Um, I'd like to offer an alternative which I can have a better chance than that because in a, in a capitalistic society like we have, this is never going to happen. Universal apps are not going to work. End of story. So I think it's wrong for uh, people to go down that path because it's a dead end from my perspective. It's like healthcare, uh, where there's a single payer solution. It's never going to happen, and you know why. It's politics. And it's never going to happen either for the universal app. The alternative, which has been done in other industries, which does work, is to have a data exchange standard. And, this, and that takes care of the problem because then you, anybody has to comply with the data exchange standards. Doesn't matter how many companies come into the market, let the market work it out. The TLC and maybe eventually throughout the country, you can have one data exchange standard. All the apps have to meet it, and everybody's not free to make money however they want. Uh, that's really a better uh, path to follow than to try to go with this universal app idea because I think that's just a fail. Uh, field way to go. Well, that gets to the same place where you as a consumer can use your app anywhere. And if that app provider has in app ads to offset it, or if, that, that totally works. Just as well. that, if you need an example of this, by the way, look at the pharmaceutical industry that uses it for clinical trials. Universal, uh, the data exchange standard works, and any number of companies can come in and make a ton of money doing it. They have to make sure that the data that gets transferred goes in a standard way to the regulatory bodies, and everybody's happy. Yeah, that is actually um, the misnomer of a universal app. It's been used to describe what you're talking about also. Uh, there's a couple of different experiments that are being contemplated. I think Montgomery um, County is actually, Maryland is, is actually, and just to clarify for the audience, we do have to end and go to our tech panel now that you're talking about an open API platform. So, um, if I'm wrong on this, you can correct me, but I understand that the payment industry has this too, you know, um, uh, but everybody has to put their data and accessibility into the cloud, and then the TLC or the marketplace would open up a platform for any app to connect to that platform so that any driver anywhere in the city could take rides from any app. Is that what you're getting at? No. Or did you have a different, what, what were you? No, it's more generic than that. In other words, the idea is that if you specify the kinds of data that you need to run the, for this, if you specify the data that is needed and standardize the way that it gets collected, the way that it gets reported, then yes, what you're saying can also happen. But the idea is to be just much more generic uh, and provide a, a universal way for anybody to exchange data uh, where everybody is happy, and you don't stop the marketplace. My problem with the term uh, a, having a single app is that the marketplace won't stand for it, and you won't be able to implement it around the country, never mind the world. And ultimately, you can't have a data exchange standard, which will in fact work around the world. It will work in the US, it will work in New York, it will work in DC. Um, and then the regulators can, can step behind it and use it and basically specify or, and use the parts that they need in order to make sure that the local regulations are met. So it's not, it's not uh, demanding uh, 
any kind of an application necessarily to be built. It's up to the marketplace to decide what, what their app is going to do. But the standards are there saying if you to collect this kind of information, it has to be in this format. A simple example is it female, F, M, male, uh, you know, that kind of stuff in the pharmaceutical industry is important. How do you, how do you measure blood pressure, for example? So it's just the data. So you find the data, tell people how you want it right. transmitted to you, and then the market's open. All right, and thanks for that clarification. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time, but some folks wanted to, as we transition to the next topic, tech questions. So we're going to bring up uh, a couple of the app companies to talk. Let's give a big round of applause for uh, David and Tom and Robert. Uh, those of you who have questions,